Hello, everyone. My name is Austin Belzer from Austin B Media, and I am here today talking with the director of uh, Hoop Dreams as well as the star of Hoop Dreams, Madison Sutherland. Madison, Casey, welcome. Hi. 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 Madison, I do how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. It's 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 a stressful Tribeca so far. I I um, probably posted more this week than I've posted the entire year. Um, no way. But yeah, it's it's been a hectic time. I think twelve posts this week alone, and um, I've still got my um, a few reviews to write today. So busy, it's a, busy, it, busy. I mean, that is an understatement. And then I'm going right into, I haven't announced this yet, um, but I um, I have accreditation for the 2022 Bentonville Film Festival, which is literally right after Tribeca. Oh my goodness. It, it like <laughs> well, start. Let's, let's get into it. So you have time to do everything you need to do. Oh, no worries. The good thing about being your own boss is you can just be like, eh, I feel like working a four hour day. Work, I feel like working an eight hour day. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess let's just get into it. Uh, Casey, um, where did you come up with the idea for Hoop Dreams? So Hoop Dreams, as a, it's actually a real story from when I was eight. Um, I used to deal with a lot of self-confidence issues. And when I was younger, my mom, she was kind of like this boss in my home. She, she ran her home, like home beauty salon. She took care of our whole family. She cooked for all of us. And that was just like every day. And to me, she was always this powerful force and she always wore hoop earrings. So when I was younger, I was like, oh, the kids at school would think I'm a boss and think that I'm cool if I wore um, my mother's hoop earrings. So I ended up stealing them from her jewelry box. And when I took them to school, um, I uh, one ended up getting lost or broken. I can't remember exactly, but that story had always stuck with me, me feeling like I needed to put something on in order to be the person um, that I knew I was inside, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, because I think we all have kind of this, I think when we're at that age, uh, we're just kind of struggling with self-confidence issues. Like, how do I fit in? Where can I fit in? And sometimes even just, okay, how do I mold myself into it until I fit in? Yeah, exactly. Um, and on that note, uh, Madison, um, you're given a bunch of stuff to do here. Specifically, uh, a lot of the dialogue is delivered in iambic pentameter for my uh, English nerds out there. Um, but I guess, how did you prepare for uh, hoop dreams? Well, at the beginning, Miss um, Casey came and she started practicing with me. That made it pretty easy. And, and I ended up getting like the, like the first page done in like the first day. <laughs> She was really good at remembering her lines and we had a really good time rehearsing too, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I was never that good of a student. I could, you know, I was in a play my last year of high school and um, and uh, let's see, I, I think I, I had like two weeks to memorize it and it took probably that entire first week just to get past like page four. Right, no, Madison has a really great memory and she was so easy to work with. Um, and I felt like, I feel like we just played, you know, where mm -hmm. I was trying not to make, um, you know, cause that could be so serious, especially for a child. And this is Madison's first time. Um, yes. So sometimes, you know, I would forget and kind of, um, you know, be working and, you know, and I'm like, wait, I have this baby girl on set and I need to make this fun for her. I need to make this, you know, um, but I think we got through it. Right, Madison? Yes. <laughs> Did you have fun on set? Yes, it was really, really fun. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, Tara. Hi. Hi, Sorry, Hi. No worries. We're just all getting to know each other here. Um, welcome, Tara. Um, so I guess since you just got here, I'll ask um, 
I'll ask as a producer, what drew you to this, uh, to Grind? Um, the script first. So Gil, who's also a producer on this, sent me the script. Um, Casey was new to directing and he kind of just was like, hey, can you step in and help oversee it and just make sure all is well and, and think it's interesting. And I looked at it and the authenticity of her voice in the story was so clear. Like it was like, she knew, ex she knew the story, like she, she was that little girl. And I think everything that we in the company do it's super authenticity is super important to us truly you know because there are so many cool stories and everyone has a cool story on every level and so you just want to really learn that story and like for me I like to just get lost in a story and I felt like I could do that within this script um and then on top of that I just it was like the the hoop dream thing is that I mean I was like my mom's for me Ron so she didn't wear hoops but I did and like that could have been me I just immediately was transported into being a child when I read it like I was like oh my god I get this so yeah, yeah. and I think part of that is again uh circling back to iambic pentameter kind of gives it a kind of Dr. Seuss type feel like a ch uh, child storybook kind of feel mm -hmm. um so Casey um just what inspired that um narrative structure of that um well when it comes to like the storytelling structure it actually just started as a poem that i wrote and it was actually i was writing the poem initially for my mother um as just like a thank you for being this force in my life um but when i read it um you know my background i you know i write full length scripts and so i kind of have this innate like the way I write, even in poetry, like three acts, you know, it's like beginning, middle, and end. It's just kind of the way that I learned. So in the poem, the way it reads, it reads like a story, you know? So when I would read it to people, they'd be like, oh my God, I just visualized everything that you were saying. Like this feels like a movie, even though it's a poem. Um, so when I got the, my, my friend, uh, who's also a producer on this, Samantha Nirenberg, she sent me a link to the Soho House um, shorts competition. And she says, do you have a short to send to this? Like, this would be a great opportunity. And I only had that poem. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to write it into a short. Let me just like write out visually what will be happy happening underneath, you know, this dialogue. So yeah, after I wrote it out, I was like, wait, this actually works. It almost is like it should have been this the whole time. Um, so yeah, and I've always been um, like when you when you're talking about like Dr. Seuss and that whimsical feeling, I've always really been into like Wes Anderson. And I really love how like Spike Lee uses colors. Um, and even though like it's coming from a child lens, like I wanted to have that whimsical feeling, like that's why we have like the miniature set and the colorful and like the special effects. But I also wanted to like have a sense of integrity where it felt like more mature. So it was like, it's not only for kids, but it's for our age group is like older, like any age, you know, like anybody could relate to this. Like, you know, sometimes when you watch a Disney channel, it's like, oh, this is like two kids, like two kitty for me. Like, I don't really want to watch well. it. You know, it's just for kids. I didn't want it to just be for kids, but still give you that feeling that makes you transport and makes you feel like it's magic, you know? Kind of reaching into the childlike self and everybody, you know? That was that was the goal. Yeah, for sure. And um, talking about that mix of mediums, uh, um, that I think that kind of just answers the question, but um, it... it feels like this wholly original idea, which is actually what made me want to watch the short at Tribeca was, in fact, I actually didn't even know about the iambic pentameter. In fact, I was trying, as I was listening, watching the short on my monitor here, I was like, okay, I know the, the word for this. And my English brain was like, you know the word, it's like pentameter. And, um, but yeah, I think it has a really storybook quality for it. Um, and I think that's, what drives it. Um, and there's something else interesting here. Um, the score is, it, it, I would describe it as jazz infused, infused um, 
but I don't know all that much about music. So I'll just, um, so what, um, how did the idea for that score come up? Okay, so the music was very important to me. Um, and it was, so Alex Mansour, who is the composer on this, is incredible, first of all. I worked with him on um, this podcast episode. And when I would literally text him and just say, I want something to make me feel like this. And he would send me back a voice note of some improv or something on the piano. And I'm like, oh my God, this is better than I ever could imagine. So when I sent him Hoop Dreams, I sent him the script and he was like, wait, can I start the score before you shoot so that we can kind of work off of each other? And I said, yeah. He was like, and I want to record all real instruments. And I told him, he's like, what do you want this to feel like? I said, I grew up on Disney movies. I want to feel magic, but I also want this jazzy feeling because my father, when I was younger, um, like he would always play jazz music. Like he loved going to like jazz lounges and bars. Um, so it, that just feels like home to me, like the mixture of that, almost like that Disney score on, but w mixed with like the jazz and I wanted something really emotional because to me, when I was a child, that was, it was an emotional experience, even though it may seem like this small thing to somebody who's older or doesn't relate, it was the end of the world to me, you know? So I wanted this like this explosive like emotional thing that would pull you into it and he honestly did better than I could have it's like I was sitting in front of like the saxophone player and he had a, a real vi uh, vocalist and uh, there's a trumpeter um I don't know he just pulled out all the tricks for this one and I it, it, it's honestly like another character in the film yeah that would probably be how I describe it you know there's a quote of well I don't know if it's or not, but somebody once said uh, a bad score you notice because it's bad, but a good score you notice because you can listen to it even when you're not watching the movie. I feel like I, I listen to it in my car. <laughs> yeah, like I feel like that would be something if the soundtrack were to ever come out, I'd probably pull, up, pull it up on Spotify, go to work, uh, mm -hmm. listen to it. Um, and to comment on the um, the thing you said about um, kind of being on right in front of the trumpet player. Um, I was actually listening it, to it with uh, my Dolby Atmos uh, turned on and it's really, I don't know if anyone here has ever tried Dolby Atmos, um, but it's really good. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> and especially for a film where you're um, needing to be in that sound stage. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Madison, um, so you, um, so what, um, you had to kind of be in two se separate worlds in this movie at, at the same time. So, um, in separate worlds, I, I, by, I mean, is in the quote unquote live action world and the, um, I guess I would describe it as paper mache. Casey, you can correct me on this, but, uh, it looks very paper mache to me. Um, how did you trans separate um, how you played in that um, dreamlike space versus, uh, I guess, would be considered real life? Mm -hmm. Well, she, she hasn't seen the film yet, so she doesn't even know oh. how. So a lot of it we, we shot on green screen. So okay. she doesn't even know what that part looks like. So she might not exactly know what you mean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you know Madison when we would do like um your bedroom scenes when you're in that imaginary state how was that different from when you were kind of like in the classroom scenes and dealing with like real life and the kids you know did she hear me yes I did oh okay and yes I do Oh, she, <laughs> I think, uh, I think she doesn't understand the question exactly, but um, basically how was it like performing with the kids in the classroom? Uh, it was pretty fun. Mm-hmm. You felt like you got along with them? Yes. 
So was that different from when it was like me and you in the bedroom scenes, the imaginary scenes when I, when you were like dreaming, kind of doing those, remember those routines we did in the bedroom? Yes. I see that it was like two separate parts, but it still feels like the same thing for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I hesitate calling it two separate things because I'm like, well, it is kind of interconnected. Um, with each other, because if you don't have one, you don't have the other. Um, but um, I guess, um, what other um, insights um, would you like to share? Anyone uh, can uh, answer this question um, on the film and what you hope people see in it. Um, I Something that I think Casey executed so well was I think um, projects are amazing when you can build the world. And I think world building is a thing that some of the greats have always been able to do. And people are really starting to lean into and dive into now, you know, um, it's unrelated, but you have like a Denis Villeneuve and it's like, if you watch his films, he, he builds the world and he builds it through the details. And I think that that's something that Casey executed really well. So like when I read the script, I could feel already exactly what it looked like. And I thought that was step one because it was like, if I need something and I can see it, you've really described it well, be it through just the dialogue, be it through whatever, you don't even have to over direct the script to do that, right? And then when it got to the execution and especially her being a new director, she just, she knew it so well to your point, like, the score was perfect, the tone was perfect, you know, casting was perfect. And this is all, obviously it's a short film, so it's limited resource wise, and you don't feel that in the film. And I think one thing that stood out to me with the end product that I'm really proud of and feel good about, and in case you should feel good about, is just the world that was built. It's like, you know, you could watch it as a child, you could watch it as an adult, but you truly transport into being a child. It was like, it didn't feel like an adult writing it, writing it for a child. It felt like it was her purview and it was her point. And I thought that that, again, authenticity was like, was like pristine. Thank you, Tara. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and actually that made me think of a question. You know, you talk about, um, Disney movies a lot um, when you're talking about this film. So I'm just curious, what Disney movies were your main inspiration for this? <laughs> well, I truly am like a little kid. I really am. I'm like a little kid in an adult's body. <laughs> and I just, I think creativity comes from that. And I, I just, like the movies I would watch, I, I want to like narrow it down, but The Fox and the Hound was a huge movie for me. That movie used to make me cry when I was a kid. Like that friendship, um, it was beautiful. And the score was beautiful in that movie. Like I can hear it right now. I'm not going to hum it out for you, but <laughs> I also loved like, my mom was a big Cinderella girl. So she, um, every time they were coming up with like a different version, like I would always watch Cinderella, but that wasn't one of my favorite. I was more of like, I always liked the adventure, like uh, Lady and the Tramp. Um, I'm trying, oh, I, a lot of people don't know this movie, but it's called Nemo. It's not Finding Nemo, it's Nemo. And it's about a little boy who, um is in his dream and he doesn't know that it's not reality and his bed flies out of his bedroom and goes into this whole like magical world where like things are impossible that movie is spectacular that's a I believe I'm pretty sure it's a Disney movie if not oops I'm sorry it might be Pixar or something <laughs> I mean they're one and the same at this point yeah. um yeah so, I mean um I mean, if you look at a Disney animated movie and then you look at a Pixar movie, uh, they're basically the same. Mm -hmm. um, that Those were not the answers I would have expected for Disney inspirations. I And to be frank, uh, I, I thought when you said adventure, I thought you were talking like Jungle Book, maybe something like that. Mainly because that's one of my favorite Disney movies. Uh, mm -hmm. Lady and the Tramp is up there. Uh, Lady and the Tramp 2, 
it's, it's probably no no it's, 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 whenever they do a two it just never it never hits as hard although <laughs> aladdin three is pretty good oh really i don't think i've seen it uh, no, no, no nobody has <laughs> I even, I like Aladdin, but it wasn't a movie that I would watch on repeat. Like it was always Nemo and Fox and the Hound was like one of my number ones, and I love Lady and the Tramp. I like One Hundred and One Dalmatians too, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's more that I'm not thinking of right now. But I wasn't I wasn't so much with uh, like Princess uh, Fairy Tale. I was more, I like the animal uh, movies more, <laughs> or like a little kid dreaming, you know? Aristocats? I'm, I'm not a cat person, so okay. I'm a dog person. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I just want to thank all of you all for coming on. Um, I know it's a Sunday. Tribeca is busy. Um, I mean, I was talking, I think before we uh, started recording, I... I've probably posted more today, not today, um, this week than I've posted the entire year. Uh -huh. um, but if people want to catch Hoop Dreams, uh, it's available starting on June 14th via Tribeca at Home at uh, 6 p.m. Um, via the At Home Short Pass. Um, I think that's $25, which is also the top, uh, price of the individual screenings. But I just say for the same money, get the shorts pass, or even if you're a high roller, um, do 150, get all the um, at home selection. But if you're in New York, uh, you can also check it out uh, tomorrow or today um, at the Angelica or Cineopolis at 5.45 p.m. tonight or 5.45 p.m. tomorrow night. That's right. Yes. Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming on. I, I know it's a busy, a busy time. Uh, uh, oh, and it's playing in the sink or swim. So if you can't find it, uh, look for the sink or swim category at, in Tribeca at home. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much for coming on. Have a great thank day. Thank you so much, Austin. Thank you so much.